So I'm going to let Riley go. Welcome this afternoon to Instructional Practices for Promoting Progress for Struggling Learners. This is our Progress Center's third annual private school forum, and we're excited to be here today to talk to all of you as private school practitioners and think about how do we uh, promote progress for our students that struggle, especially our students with disabilities. So welcome, and I hope you enjoy the content that will be brought to you by our educators and residents who we'll introduce in just a few moments. So while we're here and getting warmed up, I would love for you in the chat to tell us where you're from. Um, what state are you currently located in? And uh, that helps us kind of know across the country who is um, uh, available and uh, here with us today. So I see, oh, look at all over the US from Arizona all the way to the East Coast. Um, some, oh, the Virgin Islands, nice, very exciting. So super excited that you're here and thankful that you've joined us today. I want to welcome you from on behalf of the Progress Center. I'm Sarah Evans. I'm an I am a technical assistance consultant with Progress Center, and we are a federally funded center that looks at improving the outcomes of for students with disabilities across all settings, which is why we're here today talking to private school practitioners, because just like our public school colleagues, we and private schools also have students with disabilities that we are supporting on a regular basis. Uh, the Progress Center has three main initiatives. We really look at research and policies and guidance as one of our buckets. We look at how do we support local educators with the development and implementation of educational programs for students with disabilities. And we also look at tools and resources that are available. Today, you're going to hear about many different strategies and techniques that can be utilized in your class starting tomorrow, or you can bring back to your teachers if you're a leader in your school. Um, and you'll also be shared a ton of resources that we have made available. Next, I would like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Eamon Heiser, who is our project officer from the U.S. Department of Ed um, under the Office of Special Ed Programs. He is going to welcome us here today. David? Yeah, welcome. Uh, whenever and wherever you're joining us. Uh, so I am David Emenheiser. I'm an education program specialist at the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP. Uh, I'm the project officer for the Progress Center, which you know is hosting today's private school forum entitled The Instructional Practices for Promoting Progress for Struggling Learners. Um, and it is my great privilege to welcome you to this professional learning opportunity. So one of the uses of our taxpayer dollars develops knowledge and resources to improve the access and outcomes of our nation's children and their schools and families. <clears throat> In other words, to get quality information into the hands of those who need it. To that end, OSEP funds Progress Center to help teachers and schools with resources on how to design and implement effective instruction for struggling students, especially the students with disabilities. The center tested these materials and practices in real schools with real struggling learners. They work. So today, Progress Center will share them with you at no cost. The forum is being recorded and will be archived. So please tell everyone you know to visit the resources whenever they have a chance. So speaking for OSEP, we are thrilled that you are participating with this session during especially this crazy busy time, the beginning of a new school year. Um, I will conclude my remarks with heartfelt gratitude. Teaching our children is the most important human activity. Thank you for being there with them. With that, I'm going to turn the mic over to my colleague at the Department of Ed's Office of Non-Public Education, Pamela Allen. Thank you so much, David. It's so wonderful to be here with all of you. And I wanna thank you for carving out time 
uh, this afternoon uh, to be with us here on the East Coast. It's a little after five. And for those of you who are joining us across the country, I know it's a little earlier, but we're so grateful that you made time to join us today for this forum for the private school community. You know, at the U.S. Department of Education, we're very mindful of the independence and autonomy of private schools in our country. And with this in mind, we hope that today's forum will help you find enhanced ways of supporting the diverse learners in your schools and help them gain greater access to the curriculum so that they can grow, learn, and realize their full potential. Well, for those of you who are not familiar with the Office of Non-Public Education, or ONPE, as we like to call it, and you'd like to learn more about our work, I'm going to drop a link to our website in the chat, and then that way you can visit our site after today's forum. But just a little bit of background about ONPE. We were established by Congress in 1978 with the mission of fostering the maximum participation of non-public school students and teachers in federal education programs and initiatives. And since the passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, ESEA, in 1965, private school students and teachers have been eligible to participate in certain federal education programs. The programs for private school students are typically referred to equitable services programs, and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, contains such provisions as well. So we hope that you gain a lot from today's session, from today's forum. We're grateful you joined us. We know that you're in very good hands with the presenters today. So thanks so much and, and enjoy this the forum. I wanna thank both of you for joining us today um, and the wonderful welcoming remarks. The support and the work between OSEP and ONPE is something that I cherish and I value as knowing that all students with disabilities, all students that learn in our nation are equally as important and uh, those that educate them deserve high quality um, professional development. So I'm excited to be here today. We have some amazing um, educators and residents that are going to be helping um, really share some valuable strategies. So today's outcomes, um, are very simple. We're going to share six evidence-based instructional practices with you um, that can be used with any struggling learner um, that you come across, especially your students with disabilities. We're gonna share how those evidence-based practices can be implemented in your classroom starting right away. And we're gonna feature resources that you can come back to or share with colleagues, um, share with your staff, uh, that are available freely, as David mentioned, um, that you can access over time as you're looking for ways to support your struggling learners. I want to mention that the PowerPoint that I'm sharing today will be is available currently on our Progress Center website. Riley O'Donnell is going to uh, drop the a link to that um, PowerPoint in the web or uh, in the chat, excuse me, so that you can access that now if you would like. Um, some of the activities we will be sharing live time and some of them we will send out in a reference guide at the end. We're going to be talking about many modules that are available. Those will be sent out at the end. Um, but we wanted to make you aware that you can access this presentation if that helps you learn um, as an adult learner. Um, so please go ahead and click on that and bring it up if, that, if that's something that you're inclined to do. Next, I would like to introduce our panel or excuse me, our presenters. Um, they have been panelists for me before, so I said panelists, um, but today we have four educators and residents. We actually have 24 educators and residents from all backgrounds, educator prep programs, we have leaders, we have teachers, but these four are so special and unique to us because they are private school practitioners. And each one of them carry a different role within their school setting, and they're here today to share actual work that they're doing with students and, um, that are struggling and how you can also take some of those practices and implement them quickly. So first we have Dr. Kara Bratton, um, we have Erin Rope, Gabby Aragon, and Andrea Bregener. And I welcome them. I'm so excited that they're here today. Each one of them has a section of the presentation. So we encourage you to engage as they are walking through their material um, and uh, look forward to uh, learning from each one of them today. 
So we're going to start off really quickly just introducing the six instructional practices to promote progress for our struggling learners. These are evidence-based practices that we've um, seen refined over time through many different studies and work that teachers are doing with students across our nation. So you'll hear us talk about planning for instruction, delivering instruction, reviewing, reviewing and intensifying instruction. Dr. Braden's going to talk through that. We have cognitive and metacognitive strategies, teaching social behaviors, and instructional technologies. And each one is going to take some time to share how these uh, strategies around these evidence-based practices can help you um, boost the overall learning that your students are doing within your settings. Today, throughout our sessions, we will be sharing our six instructional briefs from Progress Center. As David spoke to it, these are materials that we have refined over the five years of our project to really think about how do we reach the students that need extra support in our school system? And so each brief covers what do teachers need to know, what planning and individual and individualizing instruction needs to take place, and how do they access the general education classroom? So if you are a general educator in your setting, this will be helpful. If you are a a support uh, teacher in some way, like a math specialist or a reading specialist, um, even a uh, elective teacher, you would then think about how are your students accessing that general education setting and how can we get started with this idea of one of these evidence-based practices. So look forward to those today. They are broke down. These resources are broke down into this diagram that shows you how to plan deliver, review, and intensify. And uh, although Dr. Bratton is going to talk about each one of those individually as an evidence-based practice, we set our instructional briefs in the same way because we know that this helps people uh, as they take in this information and are able to apply it to their learning. So I am actually going to turn it over to Dr. Bratton and ask her to uh, start sharing all about our um, evidence-based practices. Kara? Hey, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone uh, for being here. And it's great to see a few familiar names in, in the participant list as, as people are, are coming in. Um, so as I start and we talk about planning instruction, I always feel like, you know, if you're like a special educator in, in the group or resource teacher, um, you know, sometimes you think, well, I know I know how to plan instruction like that's that's really easy, right? I, I take the, you know, take the intervention curriculum and just kind of start with the lesson. And so, but just a couple of things that I think that the Progress Center um, resources in this area really do do a nice job of, of pointing out um, when we're talking about planning instruction is those ideas of, you know, really taking time to think about what a meaningful learning target is for, for a student. Um, and is that a target for a, a larger group? Um, and we can go to the next slide that kind of shows um, those broken down a little bit more. Sorry, one more. Um, there we go. Yeah. So, um, you know, setting that meaningful learning target and also, you know, looking at the the objectives. And sometimes I think we, we take for granted, especially if we do have like an intervention curriculum we're, we're using where we say, OK, we're going to start with our short vowels. And then this curriculum kind of just advances and, and I just kind of follow follow this. Um, so again, really thinking about what do we know about the student? What do we know about um, you know, their strengths, their weaknesses, the skills that they have mastered? What's going to be meaningful to them? Um, and also what's going to be appropriate given like where they are, where, where that baseline is? Um, so sometimes like those preset curriculums, you know, we do need to really look at those and look at the sequence that um, you know that they're kind of outlining is that appropriate for the student if it's a student with a disability do we need to make some kind of adaptations to that the curriculum the lessons that that are there and even within that even if you're using something that's kind of laid out when we look at those clear objectives um, you know, again, really thinking about what is it that we want the students to know and be able to do by the end of that lesson. 
so often we might get focused on the activity or again, like the lesson plan or the tool that the student is going to use or the activity they're going to use rather than what are they going to learn? What are they going to be able to do once they complete that activity? So by really kind of thinking about that and thinking through again, are these objectives for the whole class or these objectives for just that student? Do I need to modify those? Um, so those are, um, you know, important things to kind of point out in terms of planning for instruction. And um, I put an example on the next slide um, that kind of covers planning, delivering, also reviewing and intensifying. Um, but it, it's a it's a progress monitoring graph that might look you know familiar to, to some of you. Um, but using something like this, where again, when I say like set a meaningful learning target, um, if I know it's really hard to see numbers on here, but if I have a student who maybe toward the beginning of the year is reading, you know, just roughly like 54, 55 words per minute correctly. And I kind of set that target at the end that maybe around 90 words a minute. Again, some of that with setting the target could be because this is what the curriculum based measurement says the goal is. But I've also kind of assessed, yeah, I think this is a meaningful goal that is doable for the student. I think we can achieve this by the end of the year. And that kind of dotted line helps us see, are we actually staying staying on track? So this helps with our planning because like we can see in you know, November, those numbers are kind of taking a dip. They're not keeping up. So this should really be, again, where we're you know, using this data um, in this cycle of planning, um, you know, delivering and reviewing and intensifying instruction. And then really just thinking about what are those short-term objectives or what are those short-term goals I'm gonna need to get that student, you know, possibly reading, you know, 90 words per, per minute by, by the end of that. So that's just one example of, uh, you know, a tool, hopefully you have, you know, something similar in your classroom for progress monitoring, but something that's also very, very valuable in terms of planning for, planning for instruction. Um, then when we jump ahead to delivering instruction, and you know, a lot of you have probably seen if you have a special ed background or intervention background, um, you know, this model of explicit instruction, the I do, we do, you do. Um, and a lot of times, I think the step personally, what I've seen in classrooms is we're really good at the I do part where we're showing students how to do it, where we're talking through, giving them the clear explanation, providing them examples, maybe also providing them non-examples of what this doesn't look like, you know, using think alouds, like this is how I'm thinking about this this process as I'm doing it. But sometimes we jump right from that to the, okay, now you're you're ready to do that on your own. Um, and especially for struggling learners um, or a student with a disability, you know, they often need, you know, 10 to 30 more repetitions than than other students. So that that middle part of that explicit instruction, that practice part, the we do, um, is, is really, really important. Um, so this is again, where we can use a lot of those, um, you know, those asking questions, you know, again, and thinking about different levels of questions we can ask students. Some, you know, from those lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy, you know, the kind of basic things up to the, you know, more critical thinking, you know, questions. And thinking, having those questions kind of prepared as we go through the lesson. So you're not just on the spot, like, oh, I, I need to, you know, throw some questions in, in here. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, frequent responses through like opportunities to respond. I'm going to talk about that on the next slide in just in just a minute. Um, but this providing feedback is really important um, during this guided practice part, because if you think about students who are struggling in your classroom, you know, what happens when they're starting to do some practice with either and this guided practice could be with you as the teacher, it could be in small groups. If they're doing it in small groups, though, again, you really need to be kind of circulating, looking to see what they're doing, because they do need that feedback. They need that affirmative feedback that, you know, hey, yep, you're, you're on the right track. I love what you're doing with your partner. These are the right steps. Um, but on the flip side, if they're making um, errors at that point, um, again, you know, your students with disabilities, students who are struggling, um, that, you know, they'll continue to make those errors. And we don't want them to practice those errors over and over for, you know, five or 10 minutes until you realize that that's what they're doing. 
So looking for those frequent responses and giving immediate feedback during that guided practice is, is really, really important. And then just kind of gauging, um, how's the student doing during that guided practice? And when can we kind of release that to more independent practice where, you know, we're still, you know, maybe circulating, looking at what they're doing, but we've provided that scaffolding to kind of release, um, release some of those tasks for, for them to, to work on. Um, so talking about and, you know, that practical, okay, how do we provide frequent responses? And some of you have maybe, you know, heard of those opportunities to respond um, that are really effective, whether they are whole class or whether they're, you know, whether you're working with small groups of students or one-on-one. Or -on -one. So I would encourage you, even if you're with a small group and think, yeah, okay, like, I don't really need to do this as much because they're getting a lot of, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one attention during that explicit instruction. You know, they still really do need these frequent opportunities to engage and respond and interact with you as you're, you're scaffolding those supports during explicit instruction. Um, so I put a couple examples here that um, actually I think Andrea uses in, in, her, in her classroom that she was able to share with me. So these can be a, a number of different things things. These can be little visuals that have like a thumbs up, a thumbs down. You'll see they have one that has a thumbs up and like a slow down, slow down sloth. Um, they could be cards that have, you know, multiple choice for A, B, C, D. Um, and, you know, some teachers do use whiteboards too. And, and I, I love those. Sometimes it does take students a little bit longer to like write a response on the whiteboard. So think like if you're moving quickly, like, hey, maybe I do want something that they could just hold up the number one or hold up the letter A. Um, I always liked it when, if I was using these in a larger class, if they're color coded, like the letter A is always green, you know, B is orange, because then if I'm a teacher looking at a larger group, I can very quickly assess and say, oh, yep, the majority of the class is holding up red. That was the correct answer. So it gives you a real quick visual assessment of how the students in the class are doing if they're, you know, again, interpreting the information, if they're understanding, you know, especially during um that that guided practice that that you're doing so you could do true false um you could incorporate technology if you haven't used like mentimeter slido or kahoot those are those are great options and sometimes i've seen those used really well but teachers save them all for the till the very end of the lesson so think about you know again ways that those could be integrated every couple minutes because especially if you have students who are struggling to focus um, you know, it, it's difficult for them to listen to a lot of verbal information without engaging. So, you know, think about how you could use those response cards every couple minutes just to keep students engaged. And again, do that quick assessment of whether they're understanding the um, the content. And then that allows you, again, to provide that immediate feedback. If you see that the majority of the students held up the letter C and really the answer was A, then you could kind of pause before it, you know, we get too much farther in that in that practice in explicit instruction. And you could kind of take a step back um, and, you know, provide that feedback and, you know, make some uh, corrective, you know, correct that um, before you move on with the class. So it's a really good tool to use during that explicit instruction. Um, one other thing I've seen with this is you could do like a, a red, yellow, and green uh, color cards. So like if you make a statement and the students feel confident, like, yes, I know that they could hold up their green card. Um, same with the yellow or the red, They're like, oh, I'm not really sure I know the answer to that, or no, I don't know the answer to that question. And the trick there is if they hold up the green, you know, great. Um, but if they hold up the yellow or the red and you're asking a question, then they have to write down what the answer is to the question because they were unsure or did not know what the answer was. So that's a good way for them to then take that next step practice and say, okay, now I'm going to write down the answer. And even if a student held up green that, hey, I'm confident, I feel like I know the answer. If they got the answer wrong, then you say, okay, then I want you to write down, you know, just, um, you know, kind of. Um, you know, guide yourself and, you know, kind of monitor your own learning and write down the response, even if you held up green and got the answer wrong. So a lot of options, a lot of quick ways to engage the students and, and provide those opportunities to, to respond there. Um, and if we can get, and uh, we're going to, Sarah's going to show a quick video again, just uh, with putting some of that together with an example of delivering instruction. 
map there. And you know what? I'm going to make a map for myself right here because we can do this one together. So I'm going to have a box and an equal sign and another box right there. Okay? So we have our fraction tiles. So what problem were we going to work on this time? 3 plus x equals 6. 3 plus x equals 6. So what is the first thing that we're going to show? 3. 3. All right. So I'm going to show 3 and I want you to show 3. And are we going to put it on the left side of the equal sign or the right side? The left. The left side. All right. So go ahead and get your 3 out and show, put them, set them up right like that. Mine are hard to see on the bed, <laughs> on my, my tan desk, but it works out. And then to that, we're adding what? X. X. So which of these manipulatives can we use to represent X? The rods. The, yeah. So we'll go ahead and put our rod there. All right. So I've got three plus X. And then on the other side of the equal sign, how many do we have to put up? Six. Yeah. Six. All right. You want to go ahead and get six and I'll get my six out here. All right. So... I like your double counting there to check. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, I have six, you have six. Now we want to isolate the variable. variable. And what is our variable? Is it the brown cubes or the green rod? The green rod. Green rod, because it represents what? The X. That's it, yeah, so we want to isolate that variable. So how can we do that? What can we do with these units right here to isolate that variable? We create zero pairs. Yeah, we're going to create zero pairs. So how many zero pairs do we need to create? Three. Three. All right, so you want to go ahead and create your three zero pairs, and I'll create my three zero pairs? Okay. All right, we've got that. Now, if you put three zero pairs on the left side of the equal sign, what do you have to do to the other side? You have to make it on the other side. You have to make it on the other side. And how many zero pairs are we going to make over there? Three. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring out some more. We probably need some more of these units. Oops, <laughs> didn't fall there. All right, so we need three. Okay, all right. So let's see, my work looks like your work. All right, well, it looks good. Now we need to isolate that variable. So what are we gonna do with our zero pairs? We move them away. We'll move them away because we're gonna kind of take them off of our workspace. So let's go ahead and move those three zero pairs away. And then how many zero pairs can we move away over here? Three. Three, so go ahead and do that too. Okay, so when I have three X plus six, X equals what? Three. Three, do you wanna go ahead and fill that in there and make sure that that checks out? Okay, and if you told me x equals 3, so I could just go ahead and write a 3 in there. And now you tell me, does that check out? 3 plus 3 equals 6. Yeah, so did we solve the equation correctly? Awesome, good job for us. From idea to submission, empower students to do their best work with Grammarly's generative AI. What if they could jump? All right, so we'll jump back. So again, a great example of, of seeing, um, that was Dr. Sarah Powell at um, University of Texas at Austin. Um, she does great, uh, great information, um, great articles and research on math instruction. So again, you could see that kind of explicit instruction play out in her interactions with, with that student. Um, and because there's obviously a lot of information um, and even the planning and delivering instruction, there are some links that again are available in the PowerPoints um, and, and that Riley will send out that again, go more in depth. And these are all free from the Progress Center, um, the planning instruction and delivering instruction instruction um, that you can sign up. You can you can read the information briefs, but there's also an online course that takes about 25 to 30 minutes for more information. Um, and there's also the National Center for Intensive Intervention self-paced course that's all about explicit instruction. So it goes more into depth on, on those. And I think on the next slide, there's also some links um, from NCII um, to literacy sample lessons and math sample lessons. So if you're again wondering like what could this look like, especially if maybe you're not as comfortable teaching math or you're not as comfortable teaching um, literacy skills, um, NCII has some great resources, great lessons already laid out for you. So that's awesome. Um, then finally, uh, to kind of wrap up my part is we talk about reviewing and intensifying in instruction, because I know this is often like the big question, um, again, how do we know, you know, when to move on, what do we do with students? Um, and the, you know, the big thing we look at is that that NCII 
um, they have a data-based ind individualization um, graphic, and they have a whole module that kind of goes through it in, in more depth. Um, but that really talks about, and I think that's a couple of slides, slides ahead, if we can skip ahead to that one. Um, but it really shows um, that, again, yeah, they're on, on the right. Even when we're using a validated intervention program, because this, again, comes back to that, like thinking about what, you know, planning what we're doing, seeing how students respond, rather than just going from lesson to lesson and thinking, well, this is a great intervention program. So if I follow this and, you know, yeah, a, a lot of times that will work very well for a student, but we do need to think and we do need to, you know, use, use our teacher brains to see, is this working? Is, are students meeting those learning outcomes before we kind of jump ahead? So progress. Progress monitoring, again, seeing our students responsive. Um, is that pro progress like that graph I, I showed um, a few slides ago? Are they improving or are they kind of stagnating? Um, are, are we kind of hitting that plateau? So if they're non-responsive, again, what, what additional information do we need? Do we need another data source? Do we need to dig a little further with some kind of diagnostic assessment? is going to give us some further information to, again, help us adapt the intervention again, and then again, continue to progress monitor, and hopefully we see a response. But if not, again, we just kind of, you know, keep going back to this cycle of, you know, assessing, seeing how students are doing, and not just assuming that they're progressing like we want, because we, even if we are using a validated intervention, you know, again, we need to keep track of that and, and keep track of all those, those things that we might need to intensify. So again, thinking about like intervention dosage um, and this too, I know, you know, your school, you might not be full time at your school. You might have limited, limited time. Your school might have limited resources for people. Um, but think, you know, research also shows that more frequent and shorter interventions is usually more effective than just longer. So if you say, okay, I see this student for 30 minutes twice a week, I'm going to see them for an hour twice a week, maybe think, okay, is there a way to see them four times a week for 30 minutes versus longer periods of time? So thinking about that, that dosage um, and how we could how we could adjust that and opportunities to respond again like i showed with those response cards think about am i using those enough is there a way i can incorporate those more do some students again need more repetitions because they're still struggling um, and i need more checkpoints as i'm teaching to see how they're responding um, and then again that that alignment and, and transfer. So again, thinking about how the skills are going to align and thinking about, you know, again, using reading as an example, if we're teaching a student how to like blend um, and they can, you know, maybe read and decode individual words, are we then, you know, building on that? Okay, can they then read full sentences? Can they then read full paragraphs? Are we teaching them how those skills apply um, to, you know, in, in a broader perspective and across subjects? So that's kind of that, that transfer idea idea. And a couple ideas I just wanted to share here, again, from, from my experience, because I know in private schools, again, the question is always like, well, we don't have enough people. <laughs> you know, that's always the issue is personnel. We don't always have a lot of interventionists or special ed teachers. Um, so again, when you're thinking about how you could intensify instruction, um, you know, again, think about the students who really need more intensive instruction. Are they able to work with the most qualified person to give them that instruction? Um, I have utmost respect for paraprofessionals and things like that. But if you have a student who is really, really needing intense reading intervention, um, you know, think, is that the best person to put them with? Or is there someone more qualified to provide them with reading intervention? And could the, could the paraprofessional work with the whole group? Maybe they're qualified to do that. And maybe even the, you as the classroom teacher are really good um, with those intervention skills. So maybe you kind of flip-flop those. So again, think about who that student really needs to work with. And this could also be across classrooms. This doesn't even have to be, even if you're, you know, single grade graded school, you know, again, maybe first and second grade, you have students with similar needs. So could there be small group times where, you know, there's students who are working on their phonics skills, they're working on their basic math skills. So we're combining some of those students in first or second grade and one teacher who's qualified works with one group and, the other students who are ready to move on, they're working with the, the second grade teacher on other skills. Um, so, you know, again, don't be, don't be afraid to share and, you know, try, I know that takes coordination in terms of schedules, 
Um, but along with that, some schools call that like the what I need time or win time. So again, students are moving ac across different classrooms um, at, you know, at a shared time or in middle school and high school, you know, you might see that as, you know, what typically might be a study hall time, but that student has the ability to go meet with a teach a specific teacher to get some one on one tutoring or ask for help. They don't they're not just staying in that one study hall. They're identifying what they need the most support with and finding a teacher who's available to, to help support them with with that. Um, again, there's also some great resources from Progress Center and NCII on intensifying instruction. Um, NCII has this great intervention intensification strategy checklist. So you can use that. I love that one to go through and say, hey, these are, you know, these are some ways I can intensify. I've identified through that DBI model that students need more instruction. So here's some, here's some ways I can kind of go through and get ideas for how I could intensify. And again, progress monitor and see if that student's making, making progress. Um, and there again, those are links to the Progress Center instructional briefs on this topic and also their self-paced course. So again, all of this is free. So please uh, check it out and hopefully it helps again as you work with students struggling and students with disabilities in your classroom. Thanks, Kara. Sorry, I was having some unmuting issues. I apologize. Um, I'm going to talk about cognitive and metacognitive strategies. And I will have to say, this is one of my favorite areas to teach as it is so critical and life impacting for student learning at all stages. Um, cognitive and metacognitive strategies are supports to help students develop an awareness of their thinking processes as they learn, problem solve, and complete tasks. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Um, it, it looks at just different um, executive functioning, attention, self-monitoring, and working memory. Um, the next slide has a short clip from the video, that module about cognitive and metacognitive strategies. It really talks about um, defining these strategies for us. So we'll take a look at that first. Cognitive and metacognitive strategies can help students build executive functioning skills. So, what are they? Cognitive strategies target cognitive processes considered necessary for student success in school, such as memory, attribution, and attention. These mental activities ultimately direct thinking and learning, so cognitive strategies attempt to help students redirect these areas of cognition towards relevant information and appropriate tasks. Some examples of cognitive strategies include setting goals, using mnemonics, and using graphic organizers. Metacognitive strategies are strategies that enable students to become more aware of how they think and how they can independently regulate their cognitive processes. Examples include self-talk, self-monitoring, and self-management strategies. Teaching students with disabilities cognitive strategies may not be enough to ensure that these strategies are implemented successfully or independently. To support students' use of cognitive strategies, teachers compare the teaching of cognitive strategies with metacognitive strategies. This process allows students to see them in context and understand how the strategies can be used and generalized to other tasks and settings. Thank you. Um, as educators, we know many students experience challenges with these executive functioning areas, especially those with learning disabilities or neurodivergence um, can just have an added impact on academic and behavioral barriers they may already be experiencing. So as we go through and look at how setting goals, self-monitoring and using organizers are just three strategies to approach this, we'll look at kind of how it can look in a classroom setting for different types of learners as well. So this is one model that we have found to be highly effective in supporting students in further developing these cognitive and metacognitive pieces. Um, it's from Sarah Ward's Get Ready, Do Done model. And within this framework, we start by looking at backwards planning. So we start on the right in that red area right now in the done column. 
We focus first on what we as teachers hope the end result will be, both in terms of skills and also product. Um, this can look like a checklist for older students. We could say the finished task will consist of this, this, and this. For our younger students, we actually take pictures. We put photographs or clip art images here of what we mean by finished, because we have a lot of students like, is it done, who will say yes, but really their done doesn't match our done. So we are very descriptive in this column about what a finished task will look like and the skills that we might incorporate into that, photos or checklist wise or both, um, including timelines. So we have this goal of the project, but also the goal of timelining for them and really making that very um, explicit as Kara was telling us, the explicit instruction um, around how to use this tool to support the cognitive strategies they might need. We then move left into that do column. What steps do I need to be done? And this is where we will specifically um, break down what does the finished task require in terms of like action verbs you can think of in this column. So what do they need to be done? What do they need to do? And this is where chunking really helps us in thinking about not just saying like finish the worksheet or finish your project, we really break this down and chunk it into parts for them. Again, it could be the finished part um, image wise, it could be checklist to get us there. And then moving left, we get to that stage of get ready. What do I need to get ready? What do I need to do the do column? So it would be materials. It could also be resources for students who might be using tools as we call them um, to get them into that ready zone. What do we need to have all around us to be able to do some work? Um, the clock is another measure of measuring time, but it can break down what the do looks like for students. And so we can adjust this clock. This is an extension on Chrome, or we actually have a clock um, in our room where we color it with markers, V sub B markers, to adjust timelines for students to be able to do that time management planning for themselves. And just to check in as well, we'll say like, at this point, I would think people would be at this stage of our do to help them self-monitor and self-regulate what they need, either to stay on task from an attention point of view, or if they're needing support from a teacher or a learning specialist in the room, like I'm really struggling. If I should be further, what do I need to do to get help in that way too? But I love that this framework fosters so many elements of this cognition and metacognitive stages for students. It really takes big picture down to detail thinking. It addresses planning. It addresses self-monitoring and management, um, looks at timelines, and it really addresses also cognitive flexibility. Am I able to think through the tasks I need, but also adjust accordingly if it's not going the way that we had planned? Um, it also supports struggling learners with working memory, attention, planning, and processing for students who might have these struggles for executive function beyond even those maybe at a certain developmental level. Um, the next slide are two tools that I created in order to support students who often struggle with getting started with the task, perhaps to do their thinking about the work and not the work itself. It could be the work itself as well as we know, and that's where maybe Kara's strategies of adjusting your instruction or explicit instruction and learning targets is helpful. This one I designed specifically around the thinking about your thinking, because I think we've all had a student who has said they can't write a paragraph summarizing a story, or they can't finish that big math project. And I think of this kind of as the all or none thinking of like, I can't do that. And so the part on the left, takes the task such as like writing a paragraph and breaks down, well, what do we need to do this task of finishing a paragraph? It's or idea organization. It might be brainstorming um, topic details that need to go into the paragraph. It could be then, how do I start a paragraph? So breaking the big task into chunks and listing them on the left. And then I have students rate their score before. Well, how about the first bullet point? You know, brainstorming an idea. How do you feel about that part? Let's go down to the next part. How do you feel about that part? And self-rating. And I've often found that not all parts of the task are terrible. They're not all a one. There usually are parts of these tasks where students feel more confident, maybe not as far as a four or five, but maybe they're not all ones. And then giving them strategies for the ones 
and saying like, see, you've already rated, you have these parts handled pretty well. So really, it's not that you can't write the paragraph. It's maybe you're having trouble with the topic sentence or remembering a detail. So this is helping with that metacognitive reflection of what do I know about myself as a learner and able to do each part of this task and what supports might I need from there and scaffolding the supports from there. The same thing with the one on the right-hand side, um, creating checklists for students to kind of questions to ask themselves. So accurate thinking back again to this assignment or situation and accurately judging how difficult it might be or that all parts are so hard um, and saying, what can I do for each part of it? So having strategies that students can reference the sheet after doing the I do, we do, you do model. So this would be more support for that you do part of strategy management on my own. Asking myself these questions in that first column, how hard do I view this task to be? And then I've given some like sentence or question prompts rather to talk through the thinking. And if they come to one that they're like, yes, that part, um, then they can move kind of more right on the chart. How long do will this take me? Do I feel I have the skills necessary? Because often it's it's not the skills or the time. It's just really the thinking around the task itself. So being able to break it down into bite-sized pieces. Um, so these are just two examples of supports that we can put into play for students thinking around the work in addition to the work itself. Um, next slide, please. Um, so additional resources, as Kara's already alluded to, the Progress Center has the practice brief and a self-paced course. Um, I have found the self-paced course to be incredibly helpful myself for like checking my own thinking about knowing how I'm using cognitive and metacognitive strategies. And there's a lot of more specific ex examples of how this can look in classrooms. So I encourage everyone to visit that course. Additionally, um, the Cedar Center has a learning module on this, as does the Iris Center through Vanderbilt University. All resources of self-pacing and ways to check, um, learn more information through examples and models um, and research and evidence-based practices. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. I will be moving on towards teaching pro-social behaviors. And just like Erin said, this is my jam. This is what I love to do. So um, I hope you're able to take a few tips and tricks um, to implement in your classroom as soon as tomorrow. So when we're looking at teaching pro-social behaviors, we're looking at how we are communicating and supporting our students and demonstrating how they can meet behavioral expectations and communicate their needs in a more effective way. Next slide, please. So this is the screenshot of the teaching social behaviors brief. And we focus on those behavioral expectations for struggling learners or students with disabilities. And when we look at these social behaviors, we really have to understand what are social behaviors. And the next slide you'll see that social behaviors refer to interpersonal skills that represent student, student communication and self-management. They're in areas that focus on communication, because as we know, behaviors are a form of communication. They are learned behaviors through our inter their interactions with adults, peers, and even their classroom environment. They're learned and then reinforced. So when teachers can help shape behavior through those intentional modifications, sometimes to the environment, but often to our own instruction, we're then teaching our students how to meet our expectations in the most appropriate way. We're looking at that self-awareness, self-management, the responsible decision-making, our relationship skills, and that social awareness. And all of these can fall under social skills with their peers, with adults, but also in meeting the regular expectations that you have in your classroom. So those keys for explicitly teaching those behavioral expectations you're going to, going to want to look at selecting a replacement behavior. And the replacement behavior is what we want our students to be doing. So we're identifying the behavior that we don't want them to do and the behavior that we would rather them do instead. And as we select and find that behavior that they should be doing, we want to make sure that it serves the same function. For instance, 
if you have a student who refuses to complete any difficult work, maybe specifically in math, because you know that they struggle significantly. Rather than having them throw their paper on the ground because they don't want to do it because it's really hard, you would teach them that replacement behavior. Maybe it's asking for a break, or maybe it's just asking for help. And that can look like teaching them to say, I need help. But it could also be a visual if they're not ready to say it in front of all of their peers. We're looking at how we can modify the classroom, whether that's our own instruction or maybe it's the environment. How are we going to set up our classrooms and the environment in which our students work every single day to have a positive impact on behavior? What can we do to adjust or change these environmental pieces or even the procedures in our classroom to promote the behaviors we were looking to see more often? And we're then gonna implement a system to promote these replacement behaviors. We're gonna reinforce what we want to see, but how are we gonna reinforce it? What systems could you use in your class for everyone and for those individual students who need higher levels of reinforcement? It's not catching your student every single time they do what you want them to do. It's catching them every now and again to continue to promote that replacement behavior. So when we look at how to apply this in our classrooms, just like Aaron spoke about and what we would do in an academic way, we're gonna use the tools like the I do, we do, you do and model for our students. We're gonna show and give them clear explanations or examples. We're going to model for them. We're going to practice with them. And then we're gonna provide them those supports as they're continuing to work on these skills. This specific visual was pulled from the Teaching Social Behaviors course, and then originally from NCII's Features of Explicit Instructions. But when we look at this, we want to make sure that we're not just thinking about this in an academic way, but also in a social way. How can we use the same model to promote these social behaviors? The image on the right is a very small piece of a form that I created um, for some for some students on my campus. Um, the form is a whole, looks like all the days of the week, and then it's organized by their subject areas, focusing on two behaviors and only two that we're wanting to see them utilize regularly. So that this student was first time listening in a safe body. And then this served as both a tracking system and a reinforcement system. So the idea behind this is when the teacher saw that a child was using first time listening, they just put a little tally. And at the bottom, there was a total. And so the student was earning points throughout the day, trying to meet specific numbers to either cash in some sort of reinforcement at the end of the day or combine all of their points for a bigger reinforcer. We had each of these broken down by subject area, so it was attainable for the teacher. It wasn't done by a minute to minute basis, but more in time blocks that the teacher found to be you know, a good point of, okay, I know we're about to move, so let me make sure that I'm really focusing on these behaviors. It is not meant to catch every time, like I said previously, but that intermittent reinforcement where you're tracking it, but also letting the student know, like, I see how you're showing me that first time listening. I'm going to give you a point. These stayed in the folder, so it was something that the parents could refer back to, but then came right back to school so we could track throughout the week. As we continue to look at these teaching pro-social behaviors, we also wanna look at how we're prompting our students and how we're providing them that independence in the classroom to meet those behavioral expectations. That could look like the visual on the right where it's the four expectations that the teacher has in the classroom. Raise your hand, eyes on the teacher, listen to others and keep your voice down using whatever images, whether it's of the student or other graphics that you have as a visual cue on the student's desk or maybe on their pencil pouch or even on your board if it's something that everybody's looking at. Components that you could add to this would be like a one, two, three, four. I'm looking for one and you're using your fingers to show students exactly what you're looking for without having to use your words. I have used this very successfully on desk with students and then had kids help me pick out 
you know, the visuals that they want to see. Because when the student is engaged in what they're going to be utilizing in the classroom, they're more likely to use it. And then the student reward chart. <clears throat> what this could look like and what I use on my campus um, is more like a trading card. So I call it a star chart. And I have students pick images of their favorite sports character or their favorite movie. And we put the image in the background. And then we work on, we have, I put a little graphic um, symbol of a star and maybe they're only working for five stars. And the teacher can then, if the student exhibits that first time listening, they put a sticker on top or a little check mark on that star. And it tracks that student. It shows them, they keep it on their desk. It shows them, oh, I only need three more stars till I get to cash this in. A lot of students, because it was an image that they liked, really wanted to just keep the card and use them kind of like a Pokemon card. And they would collect their cards and then just keep them. And that was reinforcement enough. But this can be used for any type of behavior, whether it's first time listening, keeping hands to self, or getting ready at the end of the day. The same types of visuals could be used for packing up. And you're showing the different pieces that a student needs to pack up their materials at the end of the day. So that prompting from the adult is being taken away and they're starting to gain that independence. All of these skills are continuously communicated home, letting parents know what we're working on and how we're reinforcing these pieces and the language that they're using. They can take them to their elective classes or if there's a sub that day, there's these little pieces that the teachers can leave. You know, this is so-and-so's reinforcement card. Make sure to give them a star if they're showing their first time listening skills they can then continue to reinforce even when you're not in the classroom. Our paras or our assistants can do the same thing if they're seeing that students are exhibiting these behaviors that we want to see. Next slide. All right, when we're looking at these resources, we have the link to the instructional practice brief on teaching social behaviors, the self-paced course, which is, I believe, about 25-ish minutes, um, which is just a brief synopsis of teaching social behaviors. And then NCII has self-paced courses that are pretty intensive. You'll need multiple hours to get through all of them um, on behavior support as, an as intensive intervention. Um, these I would recommend if you are needing some more kind of guidance. There's worksheets to complete. There's a workbook that you can fill out. There's tons of videos. It's an incredible um, coursework to kind of go through. I believe there's eight modules. Um, and as you work through them, they kind of build on top of each other. So if you're going through these to make sure to start at the beginning, don't just try and kind of enter in halfway. And then PBIS offers such phenomenal resources, but there's a practice guide on supporting students' social, emotional, and behavioral needs. That's quite intensive. That's a really good resource to kind of have printed with you um, so that you can kind of go through it and then be able to refer back to it um, when you're needing some additional guidance. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, sticking with us uh, this evening. Um, you'll see that with the instructional technology, there's a lot of overlap between the other um, the other evidence-based practices that have already been mentioned. Um, so with instructional technology, we're, um, we're using that to boost academic and behavior instruction. Um, one thing that I wanted to clarify that it's mentioned in the practice brief um, that is sometimes is um, kind of bundled together or confused is this instructional technology is different from assistive technology. So when we're talking about assistive technology, that would be like text to speech or speech to text or an audiobook or a calculator. Those are um, those are tools that are used to overcome barriers in the learning environment. Um, instructional technology is. Um, describing a broader tool versus tools that are used um, during instruction. 
Now they can work hand in hand. A lot of instructional technology features will have some of those assistive technology features in them. Um, but I did want to clarify before we move forward that the focus is going to be more how we can use technology tools during instruction. Um, so within instruction, you're going to notice, like I said, a lot of overlaps between some of the things that our other um, presenters have already shared. So first off, just like you would with any academic skill, you need to have clear measurable objectives that incorporate the use of technology for the learning outcomes. Um, we all know, especially post-COVID, that um, there are a wealth of different um, instructional technology tools out there. Um, they're not all created equal. So this goes into the next piece about evaluating them for its appropriateness. Um, so looking at does the tool match the academic objective that you um, that you have? Um, also having to assess, is it appropriate for the student that you have? Um, I think sometimes we assume that because um, the children that we're teaching are digital natives, um, the types of technology that maybe they're using for recreation isn't necessarily the same tools as that they're using for instruction. And it's sometimes assumed that a child will know how to use th um, different technology tools in the classroom um, when they're not necessarily used for, um, for entertainment purposes. And just like anything else, it needs to be explicitly taught how to use them. Um, and also determine whether or not it's appropriate for the tool that you want to use. Um, and, that, and for that purpose, you might need to teach the content separate from the instructional technology tool, depending on the situation. So um, still following that I do, we do, you do model, if you're introducing a technology tool to the students that they may not have been exposed to, trying to teach it in the context of the academic content is probably going to be overwhelming and frustrating for the student and for you. So it needs to be, um, the, the technology tool needs to be um, pre-taught and make sure that students feel confident in knowing how to use it and then embed it into the context of the tool. So like, for example, um, if you're wanting students to use a PowerPoint uh, presentation to explain um, learning of academic content, um, the students need to be familiar in knowing how to use the PowerPoint tools first before you would want to use that as a tool to explain the academic content. Um, also being mindful of what your comfort level is with that instructional technology tool. Um, if you are not comfortable using that tool yourself, um, it's going to be more challenging to embed that into your instruction. So utilizing and uh, teaching yourself on how to use those tools first before you're bringing it in and using it with the students will also go into um, determining whether or not it's appropriate to use for your specific lesson. Um, so once you've determined what is your objective, um, how are you going to use the tool? Is it appropriate for the students? Are the students confident in how to use that tool? Then as you're using it in your lesson, you're going to use formative assessment to monitor student progress. Um, and you're going to look at it in both um, formative assessment in two ways. Is it reaching that academic learning outcome? And also are the students um, able to use the technology? At, and if not, then do we need to go back and reteach how to use that particular tool? Um, one of the things that I really like about using technology for formative assessment is as opposed to having a student do an assignment on paper, um, teachers get overwhelmed, they may, um, you know, papers get piled up, and maybe, you know, grading isn't doesn't get done till the weekend. Well, you don't know whether or not the student has mastered the objective that you taught on Tuesday if you're not grading the paper on until Saturday. Well, the nice thing about using um, technology is you can get real time information and determine and make adjustments on the fly based on how you want to continue on with, with your lesson. Um, if you are using, uh, and then along with that, then you can use, review that formative data and make decisions. Now you can also use technology to um, provide summative data using technology as a way to give um, as a way to assess at the end of a lesson, you're still going to review that data. 
Um, and then based on that data, um, like Kara mentioned earlier, determining how you're going to intensify and individualize your instruction. And the nice thing about um, some different technology tools is you can have all the students work on one particular um, instructional technology tool, but all of them can be working on something slightly different. Um, so on the next slides, I'll kind of give you some specific examples of how I use um, instructional technology tools and these different um, these different um, outcomes in the context specifically, particularly in math, of how I've used them with my own students um, as a classroom teacher and also as an interventionist. Um, so one of the things that I use um, is virtual manipulatives a lot for math. Um, so that kind of gives an example of the screenshot there. Um, the two on the right are other tools that I use, quizzes and seesaw. So um, quizzes can be used as a whole group. Um, it can also be used in, um, I've used it in small groups or um, individual students. Um, and quizzes can also be used um, as a summative. So they can be do, doing it as practice. They can also do it in a game format. Um, and they also are getting real time, they'll getting, they can, um, also get real-time feedback. So for example, on the six times one, they can see whether or not they got the answer correct. A report will come up at the end. I use this for goal setting and then they'll do the same quiz again and they'll see, okay, did I, um, was my accuracy stronger with multiplication facts as I continue to do the same quizzes? Um, on the bottom screenshot, that is Seesaw. Now, typically um, Seesaw is used more with the primary grades. Um, I love Seesaw for older students as well. Um, and so one of the re ways that I loved using Seesaw and I've seen Seesaw used in the classroom is to provide, again, that formative assessment. So um, you can either create activities or assign activities to students. I also like that there's multiple modalities. So like Kara mentioned, in terms of different opportunities to respond, Students can respond um, by recording themselves on video, recording audio, they can draw, they can type. Um, so different ways of representing what they know. And then like you see in the screenshot, the teacher is able to give feedback. This was a first grade, um, first grade example. So you can see that there's not gonna be a lot of, like a number grade necessarily, but the student is still getting feedback on whether or not they accomplished the objective. Um, with Seesaw also, if the student wasn't successful the first time that they did the assignment, um, the teacher can give feedback and then they can send the assignment back and the student can complete it again. So they're getting, um, they're still getting feedback on the assignment, but in a digital format. And then if we go to the next slide, um, in terms of how to intensify and individualize instruction, these are two screenshots of reports that I use all the time. Um, our campus uses IXL for math. IXL can also be used for language arts, for science, for social studies, for Spanish. Um, with math, um, there we use what's called the, the real-time diagnostic. Um, and that's a tool that we use for, um, for progress monitoring multiple times during the year. Um, once the students complete the diagnostic, it will give them specific skills for the student to work on. So for example, um, this is a way that you can individualize instruction. So the um, one of the other presenters mentioned like that win time, that what I need time. Well, the skills that are in the IXL diagnostic can be perfect for them to do where it's specifically meeting their needs. Um, within IXL as well, um, students have access to the entire curriculum, pre-K through calculus. So you have a fifth grader, you're a fifth grade teacher, you have students that still don't know their multiplication facts. Well, they can practice those in the third grade strand, but you've got students that are already wanting to work on pre-algebra skills. Well, they can do that too. Um, so we, um, that's one way that I use the diagnostic. Um, I also like IXL for um, their live feature. So you can have all of the students in the class work on the same question at the same time. The teacher can have it projected on the screen. They can um, see real time how students answer. One of the things that we sometimes see um, is that students wanna hide. They're a little afraid maybe to raise their hand in, in class. 
but when they are solving something on um, an individual screen, it takes the pressure off a little bit. So all students are held accountable for their learning. The teacher can see what all of the students are able to do, um, but they can answer questions um, real, um, they can answer a question and work on a scale in real time. Um, and then also there is a, um, a feature that the teachers can do a live classroom. So if students are doing individual practice, the teacher can see in real time how the students are doing. An alert will pop up. It will say, all right, the student is starting to score below a lower smart score. A teacher can immediately go over, intervene and say, hey, I noticed that you missed three questions in a row. Let's look at this next question together. Um, IXL doesn't pay me, but I can go on and on about how IXL can be used in the classroom. Um, and the second screenshot is Reflex. So Reflex is, um, our campus uses this for fact fluency. It's designed for grades second through fourth grade. Um, although at my school, we sometimes have students that are accelerated that are working on it um, earlier. I also have friends that are still working on mastering their math facts and they can use it past fourth grade. Um, Reflex is game-based. Um, which can be encouraging for students. But one of the things that I really like about it is this individualized report like you can see there. Um, so it gives them a pyramid of all of the skills that they're working on. So most of the time the students are working in reflex in their general classroom or at home. I frequently am gonna pull up this report. If you notice what's in the light green, those are the, skill, those are the um, math facts that they're still working on. Then that way when they're with me, I'm gonna target those specific math facts and um, because I know that those are the ones that they continue to work on. So I'm gonna use those intervention skills, flashcards, cover copy, compare um, different, um, different activities that I have. I'm gonna highlight those specific skills to work on. So that's another way that I use, um, that I use individualized reports to create that goal setting for them. And there's other tools out there. That, um, those are the ones that we use specifically on our campus. But if you use the reporting features on whatever um, tools that you have, if you dig into the reports, you'll be able to create goals um, um, that way using the specific reports that your different programs have. Um, so in terms of other ways that you can use uh, resources for using instructional technology, um, the instructional practice brief that I highlighted um, um, at the beginning, there is a brand new self-paced course on how to use instructional technology, which goes into a little bit more details. Um, and then the other two resources, a teacher guide on digital learning, and then the Center on um, Inclusive Technology in terms of te teaching practices. That one gets into a little bit more um, of what I was describing earlier about some different um, ways to use some of the assistive technologies as well. Thank you, Andrea, and all of my educators and residents. Um, we want to take a few minutes while we still have our EIRs to open up our chat and allow you to ask any specific questions. We want to remind you, please don't jump off yet. We have a, um, a reflection for you to take here in just a second, and we want to give you time while you're still on as you are busy. This reflection is going to be very important for our um, center to be able to know what you need and how you felt this helped you in your work. This is a high level webinar that is not uh, meant to go super in detail because we offered you a lot of the modules that are all free and freely accessible to every one of you, any teacher that you have um, work with or your colleagues that can take you more in depth into each one of these areas where you want to focus. So we really encourage that you come back and, and try out some of these modules, both at the Progress Center and the National Center of Intensive Intervention. If you could take just a couple of minutes before you jump off and fill out a reflection of today's learning as we plan to try to think about how to support private school practitioners in the future. As we're doing that reflection, I'm going to ask my three educators, three, four educators and residents to turn our cameras on. And we're going to allow you guys to um, drop some questions in the chat if you wanted to ask any further information, if you wanted to try to connect with them about something that they shared. Um, 
We had some great comments about some of the instructional technology, but I know many of you um, were listening intently on some of the other areas as well. Um, we uh, just want you to scan this um, uh, so you can see that Riley inputted the reflection um, uh, link if you would rather click on the link and take that. One question that did come up in our Q&A is will we be getting um, certificates for participation? And yes, we will be sending out certificates for participation for those that attended at least 75% of the training today and you will receive that in your inbox. One of the things that you, I can tell you that we'll follow up with um, in the next day or two, we will let you know um, that we will put all the resources in a resource guide for you that you can easily access, uh, access all the links that were shared in the chat today, additional resources that were talked about that are in the PowerPoint, I'll be available on that um, sheet so for you to have that is easy and accessible. Um, share out. Again, these are free, so feel free to pass that on to colleagues and let them know that we're here and we're here to support them anyway. Um, uh, thank you. I see that a couple of people have said that links were really helpful. Um, yes, we, we will be sending those links out permanently in an informational sheet that will come, at you, come to you via email from Riley O'Donnell in the next day or two. For those of your colleagues who weren't able to attend today, but they really wanted to know, hear about this, we will be, we've recorded it and we will be sharing the recording and it will be posted on the Progress Center website with the PowerPoint and the information um, tip sheet that has all of uh, the links from today. So you can access that there permanently at any point that you want to do that. Um, I want to let you know that we can connect with the Progress Center on Facebook, on X. Um, you can email, join our email list and get updates around new resources that are coming out. Um, and we uh, would love for you to connect to the private school practitioners. So if anybody has questions for them, please, please, please uh, share them. Um, Yes, we will email you about future workshops because you're now on our, our listserv for uh, private school practitioners as we do more. Um, we will be uh, sending that out via email. Um, right now, we do not have any others planned. We have some impact stories that will be coming out from our private schools around how they're utilizing our resources within their settings. Um, and so we'll share that out as well. Um, and uh, you can check out all of our upcoming events on promotingprogress.org. Uh, we will have, we just had a couple webinars um, this spring. They're all recorded, so you can go back and watch past um, webinars that are interesting to you as well, if that helps. Um, thank you, Chad. I do agree that our presenters are fantastic, and we are so lucky to have these educators and residents that bring the real life practical application of this to all of you and get you thinking about it. We wish you well in the start of your new school year, whether you've just begun or you are gonna be beginning in the next few weeks. Um, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being in the schools with our students and promoting progress for all of our students um, who uh, need a little extra support. If we can ever assist you at Progress Center, feel free to contact us via the email um, and we will get in touch with you immediately. Again, thank you all for attending. I'm going to flip the screen back just to make sure if anybody didn't get their reflection in that you get that done. Um, our evaluator is greatly appreciated. You will also get a follow-up email. If there are no further questions, I know Andrea's uh, sending a few more uh uh, resources in the chat that we would love for you to check out. Um, Riley sent our uh, inbox or our email box for Progress Center. If anybody wants to contact us and, and talk through anything, we would love to do that. We can also get you in contact with our EIRs. So have a wonderful school year, a great evening. Thank you very much for your time um, and attendance today. Have a good night.